Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back at ECMIT TV Live. I'm very happy to announce my next guest here in the studio via live stream, Professor John Friedland, who is a professor of infectious diseases and immunity at St. George's University of London, but also deputy principal for research and enterprise at the University of London in the UK. But maybe some of you um, know him more for his role um, as a member of the executive office at ESCMID, where he serves as the scientific affairs officer. A warm welcome to you, John. Thank you for joining uh, us. Yeah, thanks for asking me. Yes, let's just start off. What does what what belongs to the tasks of the scientific affairs officer of ESCMID? Oh, well, it's quite a varied job, and I, I actually I really enjoy it. So it's um, a mixture between uh, promoting science, supporting research grants, uh, assessing the research grants, and. Uh, also overseeing the work of the study groups and then working with the executive committee for certain uh, particular awards. Uh, and we've been trying to uh, galvanize the, the study groups even further. Some are excellent, some need a bit more guidance uh, and to help them adapt in these times of change that have been brought about by the pandemic. Uh, and then... Um, so how did, well, the, how did the pandemic influence uh, the work of the study groups in your opinion? Well, so obviously all meetings and educational activities had to shift to an online format. And the interactions, which are so important for scientific and other progress, uh, really don't ha didn't happen in the way they were happening. So um, we need to support them and, and give them uh, the feeling that uh, uh, virtual events were worth doing and, and that they did have an effect, help them with, with organizing to some extent. And then also, uh, getting them to communicate more virtually. So now all study groups, for example, are mandated to produce at least uh, two newsletters a year, uh, which they can send out virtually to bring in all the different members, uh, because otherwise there is a danger that the executive will be slightly disconnect from the rest of the study groups. And we're trying to also uh, use this time to increase the size and activity of the study groups. Okay. So the newsletter, is it sent out to like mailing lists or is it, is it online available for a longer period of time? So at the moment, it, it's actually up to the study group, but most of them, it's a, it's a mailing, it, it's sent out uh, mailing to mailing lists. Okay. Uh, but okay. I think it, it's again, this is something that will evolve. It's a new development, so we'll see. So as a scientific, a scientific affairs officer, you're also very involved. You just mentioned in um, in uh, in uh, working with the research grants. Yes. How how does that process go? So. Um, we, well, we have a, a scientific affairs committee, the SAS, and we look at um, uh, essentially two sorts of, of major research grants. There are the ones related to individual applications, and then there are ones from the study groups. And uh, whereas a few years ago, the study groups put, put in relatively few research grants, maybe half a dozen in a year, now we get 20 plus uh, each year. And so there's a lot of competition for these grants. And we have a new system of... Uh, an evolving system of peer review where we peer review them by the study group uh, committee, the SAS, and then uh, the majority, but not all of them, then go out for external peer review uh, and before any decisions are made. Uh, and so that, that's an important role. And then we have the individual grants, which are really of a very high standard and very competitive. Are there a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, submissions for, for these yeah, individual grants? Yeah, a lot of submissions and also from a fairly broad geographical area, um, f uh, fairly good uh, presence of uh, uh, females and males, equally roughly even, and um, we are actually trying to increase submissions uh, from uh, lower middle income countries uh, and uh, make sure that uh, everybody around all parts of Europe, including Eastern Europe, are, are are there but but the, the, these things are gradually improving and, and it's encouraging wow it sounds like well there's a tremendous amount of support coming from the ESCMID uh, executive committee to its members uh, to to really stimulate the research um how does that translate into this ECMID? can we see well, uh, some results so we're of really that. keen i should have mentioned on in, on supporting uh, trainees and juniors and so okay. that that's uh, uh, there are really two things in this ECMID that I think are, uh, there are lots of things, but two things that immediately strike me. One is the Young Investigator Awards. 
And uh, this year, because we didn't have it last year, we have had two years of the Young Investigator Awards, which is a presentation, a special session, which was this year on a Friday. And really, the, the level of presentation was absolutely outstanding. And the range was huge from uh, translational science, clinical research, to, to really uh, basic immunology as well. So, uh, and the speakers came from all around the globe. Uh, so again, uh, fierce competition. And these clear people are clearly the scientific leaders of tomorrow. And, and it's great um, that they're applying. And the application is also to get these awards. It's, it's, it's not easy to get them. There are a lot of applicants. So Do you feel really like the exciting. quality standards are increasing every year? Well, I'm not, I mean, I've been coming to Empty for quite a long time. I, I think um, the number of people who are high quality increases. I, th I think they've been yeah. for a long time you know, one or two people who are really, really good. But now I think there's really a lot of people who are doing great uh, translational science, uh, clinical science, and as a laboratory bench to bedside science as well. So, uh, and some of them are in the COVID space and quite a few of them are not in the COVID space. They're in other areas. So, yeah. um, and it's good that other areas keep on going as we've seen throughout it, as well as COVID. So that, yeah. that's quite exciting. Yes. And then the second area, I think, which has been interesting, has, um, uh, well, I like, it, it was the, we have a breakout session with the Trainees Association. And in my group, there are a bunch of people who are trying to work out how to balance the sometimes conflicting and often hard to sort out, I think, when you're a training, demands of an academic career and the clinical career at the same time. Um, I think it's a fa fantastic thing to do because... You, you get a real diversity of experience. And I've always found it incredibly stimulating to have those two arms. But it is hard when you start. And we had a really lively discussion with people really from all around the globe, uh, Sri Lanka, in, India, great. throughout yeah. Europe. It was great to have all sorts of people. Can you involved. share with us one of your, your, your best tips to um, successfully combine a clinical career with science? Uh, so I, I, I think the first thing is you've got to want to do it and you have to not worry if you don't succeed at everything. I think you have to keep going and you need to find yourself uh, mentors who are really interested in supporting you. Um, uh, and also, if you can, travel. Use uh, things like the uh, SMID uh, opportunities to travel to other labs. And I think that's a really good thing to do. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, can you be both really well? Or is it always well, you're either you a very good clinician or you're either a very good researcher? No, no, I think you can do both. I, I think um, that, that there are clearly people who are excellent clinicians and that helps them ask really good research questions. But yeah. you do over time have to build up a team of people around you yeah. with obviously clinical skills and uh, research skills, some of whom will be overlapping, some of whom will be separate. So, so I think uh, it's definitely something that can be done. And there are many, many examples among the presenters at ECMID of people who do just that. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's also in that, in, in that sense, is the ECMID is a very inspirational meeting for young researchers, but also young clinicians, because they see a lot of really good examples uh, of people walking around, well, not physically walking around this year, of course, but going around with, uh, with, with excellent careers in both career paths. Very much yeah. so. I think that's absolutely true. And in fact, I've, the word inspirational is just is so right. I've had uh, uh, quite a few people actually use that very word about this particular ECMID already, that they found this in inspirational, that inspirational, which is, is great to hear. Well, that's excellent feedback for the ECMID organization and for ESCMID, of course. On a, on a more personal basis, um, are there some uh, uh, sessions or lectures or abstracts that have particularly caught your eye this ECMED? Yeah, well, um, my uh, own area actually is in tuberculosis uh, and um, uh, e e e ECMED is traditionally strong in, in TB and uh, there was a really good um, session uh, earlier on today, a, a mixed session, uh, looking at, uh, again, a broad range of things, uh, determinants of, uh, of drug resistance, uh, immunological responses, novel diagnostics, which uh, I think that breadth uh, it was very stimulating. And um, 
we had a lot of questions in the chat and many more questions that could possibly be answered. And I, I think that's a great sign that when it really shows that the talks have stimulated and I found them personally very stimulating. And so, do you, do you uh, feel that, the, that your field of, of, of specialty or t TB, that they're still, uh, that it's still dynamic, although a lot of focus of research is, is, is now on COVID-19? So I think uh, many things have suffered a bit during the pandemic, mainly because of resource, of course, has gone into COVID-19 and developing the different things that have been required, vaccines and the like. Um, but uh, so that I think in practical terms, TB has, has suffered in the clinic. Uh, and there's probably a, there will be a slight bounce back in numbers. But I think uh, worldwide, you know, there's a lot of push to improve treatments, make treatments shorter, detect people who've got um, uh, latent disease and try and treat them ahead of that. And also to come up with whole new approaches, uh, what's called host-directed therapy, mm -hmm. where the treatment is directed to stopping the damage of, and the patient rather than uh, stopping the uh, just just treating the bug and that yeah. combination of host directed therapy and pathogen directed tr treatments is, is i think something we can expect to see a lot more of in the next years ahead yeah it's quite it is an exciting time yeah yeah so that that's uh, that's something we hear a lot the ECMID is not only inspirational because you have some role models going around that you that you get your inspiration from but also by sharing the research and the and the research experiences with each other you get inspired for new ideas new new developments and uh, maybe that's yeah, the I think start it's of really progress. important that I think it's, yeah. it's so important and I'm particularly keen actually in that we do encourage um, uh, the trainees and, and the young people to because um, they're, they're often full of ideas, but they don't know how to get them out there. And so we, we, uh, we need to harness that a lot. And so, for example, just um, uh, in the SAS, the, the, the Scientific Committee of ESMID, we, we now ha have uh, made a, a regular and permanent appointment of a trainee member, a specific trainee member, to, to bring that perspective. And we have uh, the current uh, Scientific Affairs Officer of the Trainees Association of ESMID, on the committee, which is excellent. Uh, and uh, I, I think the more we get younger people involved, uh, the more healthy it is for the society and indeed for the Congress. Yeah. So as a scientific affairs officer, are you happy with the scientific affairs as they are now during this ECMID? Are you pleased? So, uh, <laughs> I think ECMID is great. In the, uh, and we have, um, I think, quite a, a good balance between um, uh, the, the science and the clinical. Uh, I'm, I'm keen that we do uh, push and expand into uh, pathogenesis of disease, what, what drug, uh, develops the disease, because I think um, that th th there, there is more scope for that in, in ECMID. And I think that that would then bring a, an additional tranche of people into the, into the Congress. So that's my particular interest going forward. And I, and I think, uh, uh, it's not to say that isn't represented, and, and it clearly is, but I think that there's more that we could do in that space. Uh, and I'm hoping that over the next uh, uh, couple of years that I'll be able to help uh, propel that forward. I'm hoping it with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to explain us a, a little bit more and give, you an, give us an insight in, in, in uh, everything surrounding scientific affairs within ESCMID and how that translates to this year's ECMID. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, yeah. Much appreciated. Thank you. For our viewers, we will be back on the clock of two o'clock. We will be meeting a local ESCMID member, uh, Professor Oliver Cornley, Cornley who is, uh, f I think, locally here from Cologne, will be joining, uh, joining me in the studio. So hope to see you then. Tune in at two.